hello again for those of you that might be this talk and hello for those who haven't. Thanks for joining us here. We're having a GDB walk uh, for one hour where we're going to discuss whatever people want to discuss. Um, as I've done last year, I'm going to run through a couple of slides of things we've done over the past year, but this time I'll be quicker because last year I did this and I can some half of the hour and then turns out that uh, that was precious time that should have been spent with discussion. So, uh, one year's passed since last call and we had two releases on track, hit two, one, on Hotfix release and hit three, a major release. Um, and now we have GDB 9, assembly line, uh, at some point Joel will say it's time to release. Uh, and the uh, and, and then we'll move on to discussing planning. Uh, in 8.3, interesting things that I, I noticed as I was going through the news file this morning. And it, the same thing happened last year. Like, you read the news file and you go, like, oh man, they did this and that. Such cool thing, things like the, the cloud train stuff. Uh, the C version. Okay, it's not complete, but great milestone. Uh, IPv6, finally, after maybe four attempts and 10 years of attempts. Uh, we have an index cache now. Uh, thanks, Simon. There you go. A uh, bunch of fixes to different architectures and ports and languages. We have now terminal styling. Great, Tromi. Um, frame apply uh, from Philip, I think. Yeah, Philip. So we now have MI using V3 by default. And along with that, some fixes to MI, or finally breaking compatibility in, in, in version 3, uh, fixing some. Old uh, annoying bugs in MI uh, and type improvements with Rob XP um, and uh, in you know, sand for sanitizing bow base. Uh, that's all in 8.3. In version 9, things in master that haven't been released yet, but things we've been doing the past few months. It, um, we've done more. This is just things that I noticed that were. Uh, Jump at me. Um, we finally have a way to uh, identify the version of GDB in a script, in a command line script, uh, so you can tailor your command to <coughs> work or not work gracefully in older versions of GDB. TLS supporting FreeBSD finally, um, ARC64 uh, improvements, uh, complex number support improvements. We have now a way to Get the exit code of the shell command of, or the make command. Um, and that's all, that also hooks to the pipe command that I mentioned uh, below. Uh, Python improvements, a bunch of them. And pipe command is, is a new command uh, from Philippe. It's very, very cool. Uh, allows you to run any, any GP command and then pipe and then run a shell command. So you can do, imagine you're doing help. And you want to grab the output of help, you can do pipe help pipe grab. And grab is the actual shell grab command. So it just exposes the command, uh, the C like command uh, interface to the shell, piping output to some random command. Very cool and opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. And with command, something that I mentioned in the previous talk. Um, yeah, more stuff. Uh, a way to limit uh, calling functions in the program because some systems do not want to allow that. Uh, set print finish for something about some ID I think. Yeah, it's your thing. Yeah, the it's, I don't even remember this. Yeah, it's, well, I think it was more people found that it was noisy. Oh, oh no, no, I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Set being maxed out just make GDB not go too deep into the grab call. This is Andrew's chain and here. Uh, anyway, bunch of stuff, more highlighting things <coughs> that's been improving all the time. Uh, we now have the uh, GNU highlight library used. So I think that's GNU 9, right? There, whatever. So we can highlight sparse code in the list. I think it was in the new Yeah, yeah. 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 Was it? Sorry. Yeah, it was because there's a 
was the fact for Sorry, I need to start over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, so let me see. Bunch of improvements. Okay, why not? It's interesting to see that. Uh, a small update on the C compression since I did the same last last year. And last year I was saying, oh, we still have a bunch of cleanups to eliminate. Uh, try to is still here, but super, they're all gone. We have no longer make cleanup in code base. Uh, and try caps and macros are gone. We use the normal C++ try caps. No, no smoking users here hiding that. Um, we have a plan of getting Wheeler back. It's ongoing. Uh, I was surprised actually we were very close. I uh, only spotted four instances. Your fact is dying. Man. I'm sorry. We, we, we were using back from GCC. Oh, that one, yeah. Oh, it's dead in GCC. Well, it's simplified to GCC now. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was something that I wanted to do, which was to wrap GDB in next place to GDB. It still hasn't happened. Okay. I did a take branch, it took me like two days to do that. And then I didn't post it. <coughs> so, we discussed this last year, if you remember, for those that were in the room about changing the release numbering scheme to follow more like GCC's uh, scheme that's then we settled that and now the next question is going to be <coughs> uh, we discussed recent tests last year and I saw a good number of improvements over the year uh, on this uh, people, people have been fixing recent tests uh, people have been using make check read one to spot uh, recent tests Using tooling, um, we still have them, of course, but it's improving. Uh, we discussed migrating the website from CVS to PS Um And here we are, it's 2019, and we should discuss more things. And now I open the floor to topics of discussion, uh, whatever people want to discuss. Maybe you want to start with a uh, thing we discussed last year, or anyone has any topics to start, or otherwise we close it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple. I don't know if you want to talk about the topics first, or if you want to just jump in. I'll just open the file and let me edit that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, two, the, my, the two things I, I wanted to bring up, one was I still feel like we lose patches and I think that the pinging system is bad and we should do some kind of patch tracking system. So that's one. Actually, I'm going to add also a patch reviewing system. Because it does not mean. Um, um, I know it works by uh, email. But having used a pack review system that is not email based, I can really see the benefit. Yeah, that's certainly an option. I don't mean to exclude that. And the other thing I'm going to talk about is I feel like we talked about this at the last meeting, but also it's come up in other things in the past, and that's that you know dwarf is a difficult way to coordinate. And dwarf the dwarf standard, like the process is kind of broken and slow. And it should should or can or who wants to volunteer be the dwarf person watch people from the GDP. So try to <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, you know, Joel is really good at oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know I think that, I think that'd be something. It's a it's an omission that we should correct uh, as a community somehow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, big bugs. Yeah, the big bugs, the big commits that we have about the 
version date. Uh, it's not really important to grant scheme of things, but uh, I feel like uh, a short or small group like us, it might help us compare to what we want that. Uh, we create a commit every day on both the, the, uh, the master branch and the release branch every day. And it loops the, uh, the uh, history, especially on the release branch. Oh, I see. Like for instance, uh, I'm about to prepare the 831 release. And uh, one of the things I need to do for the release is to uh, send people an announcement saying these are the changes that were made. And for me to do that, uh, I'm relying on people marking the various commits with PRs and then marking those PRs as being in 831. And I know that we need probably one or two, so I need to review the history of the branch since the last uh, release, except I have 90 or you know, 200 commits that are just in the way. <coughs> so, and this is all we needed, so that when you go to you get a version well, that's, that's the, one of the questions. What we are we trying to achieve with that, right? And I think the date is a way to easily identify with snapshot people used. Because back in the days, we would build from snapshots. But uh, a lot of times now, we can build directly from a uh, git clone. Or if you are building from a snapshot, maybe we can provide you the information differently. So, I mean, generally, when you build GDB, you get, I don't know, a version from a Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it. But uh, the, the question before we even look at solutions is, what is it that we're looking for in a version ID or version number? Uh, because uh, with decentralized uh, DCF systems now, uh, one version ID for you might mean nothing to someone else because you don't have access to that repository or that branch. Of that version of the branch that you used to go. Um, so, do we need more information? Do we need something else? Do we know? So, anyways, for me, uh, it felt like okay, yeah, you know what, just uh, provide some information that uniquely identifies the commit that you used to build is good enough, you know. But if other people have other requirements, then that would be really useful to hear that. But really, what does they identify uniquely, right? It's a ring. Yes, that is a weakness of the current uh, the current uh, way we do things. Yeah. So I, I didn't catch from offhand what other problems you've seen with the current system. Uh, with the current system, it's a uh, it's a lot of commits that are created every day, regardless of what happens in the, the repository. Uh, and then, like it, like uh, 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 Igor said. Um, it's not even perfect either. So, so I'm just trying to understand uh, what uh, what benefits we derive from it, and uh, what do we need, and can we find another way? Because this is a discussion that comes fairly frequently. Sure. Yeah, I've had problems doing the push when I'm. It's on the other. I'm, I'm doing it right almost during the daily bump, and oh, okay. and, and then and it's like, oh crap, I gotta. Yeah, fix things now, and, uh -huh. uh, and that can happen anyway with other people's commits. But yeah. it, it's really annoying when it happens with that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, nothing has changed. You know? Right, right. Yeah. So, my uh, downstream maintainer, like the version V, just because uh, it was it was in for eight, we used to do it for. Just just one point. Uh, we need to speak up loud because the mic is just on the camera. All right. Uh, so the large GB downstream maintainer. So um, I use the daily bumps as actually I use the snapshots um, every week to build another version of GDB for Fedora Rawhide, Rawhide, which is an unstable version of Fedora. So mm -hmm. um, in that sense, they are useful because they don't have to think too much about it. But you can just download the tarball, yeah, and build them. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. Uh, it is annoying, especially when. Uh, for example, talking now with my viewbot maintainer hat, I had to 
hack the bot to ignore the uh, GP administrative commits. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> right. This kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I'm not saying that we should stop the snapshots. Mm -hmm. The daily snapshots, we can continue uh, doing them. You know? yep. But we yep. still ship them without the Git information. But uh, if uh, <coughs> the Git information is all we need, then we can provide that uh, as a separate uh, piece of info, like, like a file, you know? So the be, snapshots would continue. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So well, there's one thing there that's been discussed and suggested more than once. It's mm -hmm. the daily thing. Mm -hmm. It's just blind. Yeah. It could easily detect that there's been no commit to yeah. date. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's no point in doing a daily thing. Yeah. I can think, right? We could we could definitely do that. Yeah. That, that, you that, still have different commits, but only on days that there's mm -hmm. actually been any change. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think question why they post commits on you in the first place. I mean, that should be something that at the time either you are building yourself, it should be done by the next file, or at the time you package with the snapshot, it should be done by the fact instead. And you should just get the commit ID and put it in the file, and then that's what you identify you do. That's well, what many other project do is. If you want to say, I think that just, just the hash, it, hash itself can lose this information for a user. For, because if you are building and you have a local batch, your hash is going to be different from mine. It's still GDB tapes with an, with an extra batch. And our hashes are going to be different. And a user reports a bug upstream, and currently we see the version and the date. And we can, like, you can infer can, which version it was. I mean, you can also add the the date associated with that commit. You, can, you, have, you can, don't have to commit. You can change to the repository just to find out what date this commit was. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, true. Uh, okay, we can find it in the change log. Right? So what, what counts is the date of the last change, not the date it was back. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a git block, whatever. And yeah. Andrew, get, get, you, can, you can get git to tell you, like, um, build like an ID that's based on, like, the base of so you could say I want to I want, to, I want an ID build, which is based on the merge phase between where I am now and upstream master. So it will say, here's the show on master where you were, and here's how many commits off that you are, and here's the show you're on now. So if I've made like some local commits, sure you won't my my hash won't mean anything to you, but you'll be able to look at that and say, okay, you branched off master on this day, and you made five commits locally because they're not in up, they're not in the upstream repository so you, you made this mess yourself and there's five commits and this is where you were um mm -hmm. and that that will tell you pretty much as much as you want to know right uh, how how many characters typically are those ids i think they're like short okay. hashes so Eight. definitely like two two short hashes in a, a okay. number of a few so like 40 50 characters or yeah, well, less, or yeah you think more like 20 characters 20, okay cool so anyways, yeah, I think the most important part is to uh, try to figure out what we want, you know, like you want to know uh, what kind of version it is, you know, roughly, so that we have a better understanding of, of uh, what kind of sources they use, even though it might have been 5 or 10 or, or 500 patches. <coughs> so yeah, using a, a technique like that to identify what's the uh, official, uh, the, 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 the most recent official commit. That would be one thing. Um, uh, and then we just have to program. And then that part is easy once we understand what we want. You know? And that's the part where we just couldn't agree on, on a mailing based discussion. Uh, so if we could make progress on that today, then I think we can make progress on the actual implementation. <coughs> Anyone agree? Say aye. 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 Yeah, I think I agree with that approach. Mm -hmm. So, so oh, Andrew, uh, yeah. we would still have a GB version number. Would we have date or not? Well, I think the date is going to be uh, tricky to determine because of the way Git is designed. But Git has the commits that have two dates, and none of them have anything to do with the moment that the commit was pushed. The date, snapshot, snapshot before the date. At the moment, I create a source snapshot to show I can uh, I can provide the dates as part of the information that we provide. Uh, it's just that now thinking from someone who builds from 
sources, uh, Git sources directly. Uh, what date do we put? Do we put the dates uh, that you guys developed? Is that is that we need it? I don't think so. But uh, maybe <coughs> like we have a yeah. So people are going to forget and put the paper and what they don't Yeah. Um, so I think the date is is most important when you're looking at the uh, master snapshot. Mm -hmm. If people are using master snapshot, it's going to be a wide range. Yeah. If, if it's a snapshot from some branch, by definition, it's a stable branch, and there are going to be a few commits. Yeah. But if it's a master branch, why would it be possible to make I see it being useful there. Yeah. Well, is that in one type? No, across the release. So if you see a snapshot from the GB9, is that the GB9 close to the paper 3 or close to 9? All of them. Maybe it doesn't matter. The same. Maybe we can get the same information just from account fields, ID. Yeah, I know for our customers that we, what we rely on, we rely on uh, a tag that we say this is a reference commit, and then the number of, of changes that were made. Um, I think it's it's less ideal in our environment because uh, we can expect more commits. We work on, on stable branches. So it's, uh, for the master branch, I mean, we expect uh, you know, regular changes every day. So after uh, three, four weeks, two months, the numbers are very high and we less, you know, have less meaning. That number, I, I see use for that number in two shoot situations, and I'm not clear on which is which. Mm -hmm. We have snapshots from a stable branch, maybe put our releases yeah. on the stable branch, and that's like. 8.3.1 mm -hmm. plus three patches that have been committed to the stable upstream repository. Mm -hmm. So it's 8.3.1 mm -hmm. plus three commits. Mm -hmm. But those are official commits. And then I have local commits. Yeah. My own Fedora mm -hmm. things. That number, would it be three or something else? Well, um, it depends what you use as a reference, but uh, that number is just a number of commits uh, away from the reference point. Right. So if you use the same reference point and then you add more commits on top of the three that came out from uh, the official repository, then the number will increase. So it just it gives you an idea of the number of patches it's made. Okay. Always tells you. So it gives you no sense of uh, how um, how old the, the, the latest change you put in is or anything like that. It just tells you how many commits. So, if, so you, if you commit three commits right away and then you wait for three days of doing nothing, you know, you don't know the difference with three commits done after three days. So in, in this case, I was saying, like for Fedora, yeah. you could have a version number like 8.3.1, yeah. then the hash of the upstream version we are based on, mm -hmm. that's the reference. It's not the 8.3.1 tag, it's the hash of the branch plus the already patches mm -hmm. in there. And then our local commits, those will be bounced. Uh, I think you would need two pieces of information. You would need uh, which commit uh, is the upstream repository, so that you have a sense of where uh, your changes came from. And then you would need another unique identifier for the actual commit that you use for your own repository. And, uh, and you would need both, because if someone comes to you and they hey, here's the, the debugger that caused the problem, you want to know exactly what uh, what version you use, and just knowing which which version you kind of started from, and then it's five patches and all that. That's uh, yeah. cool. something like this. What you really need is like what you're trying to get at is you're trying to get so there's someone who gives a bug report, you mm -hmm. can get the identical thing. So for something like um, for something like Fedora, mm -hmm. we could put in there the version of release of the RPM, we wouldn't need to have faith. You know, like that. So it's like they could be different, but everyone else, you have anyone, people can just, um, you know, different users can contain an individual. Mm -hmm. so. Maybe, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be in the version number, you know? If uh, that information is, is uh, we can split it in two. We can split the, say, hey, you know, use a command in GDB to get that piece mm -hmm. of information. Or we, Show it by default, you know, when you start GDB, but that's two lines, you know. Mm -hmm. 
But it is nice having both the box so if people came to the ground Yeah. Um, but then again, <laughs> yeah. Can I throw one more wrinkle in here? Yeah. So we're talking about Fedora and GDP. So when we're, when we're talking about commits. Because Fedora, we should be pull down, snapshot, and we apply a bunch of patches. Of course, those uh, patches are not committed. Right? right. They're just, and so I know in System Tech land, we put on the end of the version string plus local changes. Uh, that was a hint that this is not yeah. a version source. We can mm -hmm. get around with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's something that this jurisdiction can change the version of the handle. Yeah, I mean, you could put your well, we have uh, uh, like, like, yeah, whatever. whatever. But I think you can do that anyway. Okay. Uh, I mean, not, not, on the, not in the program's version of the handle, you know. That you get that information from the dark and negative, it's not interesting. But. Well, it's like Python, do it. If you yeah. start, um, if you start Python up, it has like, um, uh, you know, if you build it normally, it will say that Python is good enough. <coughs> but if you if you use Node one, then it will also have after its like versions thing. It has like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but all that's actually all that we generate, though. We don't, you know, it's just it just happens. Yeah. Time. Yeah. So like the default GDB would be like if it's a release bubble, it says GDB eight point three one, and if it's a dated snapshot, then it has the date on it. If it's a Fedora build or another disk version, and they have that <coughs> unique bit of stuff mm -hmm. for the whatever you need to get the actual sources. And that's yeah. the case. So I was trying to make sense of the suggestion itself. I'm not sure I catch it. If I'm understood from any suggestion from you guys, like the date doesn't matter much. And so we would end up with a question string that like they go to the one. GB version then a base hash representing the upstream base version of your base on. And then some local commit count. Maybe this part should be uh, customizable per distributor. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't make sense for Fedora request of using Git local or something. Is this what you're proposing? Uh, me personally, I'm not proposing anything yet because I don't really know. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to get a sense of what uh, everyone needs. And uh, I think I need to process the, the things a little bit to, to understand. Uh, one thing I'm realizing is that getting the base hash uh, in some kind of automated way, uh, I'm not really sure how to do that. No, it's tricky because you need to know which branch you want to compare against yeah, to make exactly. something sensible. But yeah. in, in GB, like, we could have a file, right? Some moments like base branch or something that would be master and then when you uh -huh. fork off and release branches you change that to contain the right branch mm -hmm. and then if someone clones that repository and makes their own branch mm -hmm. they would inherit that branch name so they'll know where they've branched from and then the script can then use that to say okay what's the merge base between where i am now and where i branched from and that will that will give you a sensible base hash isn't the daily bump something just for the for master? Can't you just get the hash at the moment of like, doing the daily bump and that's it? So there, there's one question here is, do we need the date? If we don't need the date, then we don't need the daily bump. Yeah. And we can just stop that process. I'm guessing that the date is only an artifact of how we used to do things, maybe with CVS, just to stamp it in there. And then you list the files on the website, because it's like a source daily source uh, snapshots, right? Because the data is there, so you can see what what are the most recent sources. So if we remove the date, put the hash in there at the time the daily bump was supposed to be, and then we can just put a date in there, but through packaging instead of doing the... Commit. So how do you go from hash to date? Well, you know the... the But it, one this is slightly confusing because we were talking about the daily bump, but the daily bump is, is it the same time we do the kind of the daily snapshot sources or? What? There is one currently? Yeah. It's just daily commits. There's a magic. I mean, do, you use, do we use the daily bump to create something that goes on the website? For example? It changes the file inside the tree that holds the version number. Okay. 
automatically changes that file and implements it. And that, that, it's a text file that the build system then sources and mm -hmm. uh, integrates into the JME binary when you do show version. It's that string. Yeah, yeah um, so this isn't met the well, story about what I've been doing on the GCC modules back where I was very careful to make sure I knew because I was screening out stuff that I'd be reading back in, I wanted to not get version skew, and I wanted to, because uh, it was a very volatile format. And I started off with trying to stamp dates on things, and that was A, difficult, and B, unnecessary. And now what I do is I essentially stamp it, stamp it with the SVN version number, and that's sufficient for me. Um, uh, I think there may be a rule in there to make sure that, that there are no uncommitted stuff or something like that. Um, in the revision, yeah, the revision yeah. number, yeah, the SVN revision, SVN, SVN revision number, and, and if it's in the Git repo, it, it's the it's the Git hash, and it and, um, and that that's been completely fine. So the uh, build system goes into the source tree and extracts the that version number. Yes, that's right. Part of the make rules is to go and extract that, and the make will fail. Uh, if I've got version skew, I think, I can't remember. It'll tell me if I've got modified sources, because that's what I wanted to know, and it'll tell me if I, what, what, the, what the, the revision that I started with is. And if that's ambiguous, it will, it will not let me build. Okay. Okay. One thing with Git is, because there are hashes are just random numbers, yes. you lose the sense of linearity. Yes. As soon as you do some sort of change, you lose the hash. So what if you do your daily bounce without an end, right? A hash attack who is in an number every day, right? Sometimes they will be 20 hash on one committee, sometimes not, and then it's spread with that, right? If the, if the main time is not. That would be not about the linearity, but just say, I think there's a way, if, if your, your git usage it implies linear history, which is true, always infer a linear number the way he was suggesting like it's a linear count that changes since some place so it wouldn't automatically be a problem but we could just use the hash um, it's half an hour just on that thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I would try to do is um, think about it a little bit but what everyone said, kind of like um, maybe start um, formalizing a little bit the requirements, uh, maybe ask questions to the community, and then from there, uh, see if I can propose some things uh, and see how it, you know, how it works by email. If it doesn't work by email, we'll get to these frameworks and these calls. Then uh, I'll probably just invite some people uh, to discuss more uh, in, you know, in, a, in a closed circle to start, make a proposal. And then from there, see how the community reacts to that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Good. Let's settle. <coughs> um, yes, we take some topics out of here. Uh, I think these are all tops. Maybe Tom wants to expand on this topic. Uh, yeah, well, let's talk about patch, patch review. Um, you know, I worked on DDB and on DCC, and then uh, the last few years I spent in the wilderness of Mozilla. And um, Mozilla does some things very differently from the GNU tools community, and uh, generally, not uniformly, but generally better. Um, for example, at Mozilla, patches don't get lost. Um, uh, in GDB, patches get lost. We don't know which ones, but they're lost. <laughs> but we do know, I think, that what happens is people send patches and the rule is you have to ping them. And some people don't ping them because pinging is embarrassing or it's a chore or whatever it is. You know, like, uh, you know, more than once in email, I've counseled people about it. Like, don't feel embarrassed or, you know, like, but I don't think that submitting a patch to a project should require, like, informal psychotherapy. <laughs> so, um, so the Mozilla approach is um, patches are in the system, you know, like it used to be Bugzilla, now they use Fabricator, which is you know, 
ant, but it's a system where the system keeps track of which patches are pending review so that they don't get lost. You can go to a dashboard and see a list of every patch that has not been reviewed. Then um, in this system, uh, one interesting thing that Mozilla does is that everyone participates in review and all patches are reviewed. No matter who you are, so the most senior people at Mozilla, their patches get reviewed by someone else. Whereas in GDP, you know, there's like a tiered system, right, where some patches get reviewed and then some do not. Now, partly that's because of like the low sort of uh, volume of reviewers. But like at Mozilla, that's solved by everyone participates. If you're a developer on the project, you're eligible to review a patch. You know? Now, different projects at Mozilla handle that differently. So in Firefox, you pick your own reviewer, which is okay, except it's susceptible to gaming, which I'm not too proud to admit that I do. <laughs> If you think, oh, I can't review this, you know, like I, you know, like I'm incapable of it. I don't understand this area, or this guy's the expert. You can forward the review, so you're not obligated to do it, but you participate. You know, um, when, you, when you do that, I'm not capable of reviewing. Yeah. How is it reassigned? There, there's in in the Rust one. There's like uh, some little language for the robot, so. I can't remember. Oh, you, you do like uh, R question mark in their username. And you just post a comment like that in the pet, in the pull request and the robot reassigns it. Okay. So that's how. Um, so uh, uh, the other thing that these things do, which probably talks, touches on the next box, but something that Mozilla and Rust both do is that um, patches don't land without the test run. And the test run is automated. And in Rust, Rust, it's like pretty hardcore. It's a two-tiered automation thing. So when you file a pull request, it gets uh, like a quick, quick, like couple hour test run. And then when you want to land it, nobody actually checks anything in in Rust. Um, and nowadays, maybe not in Firefox either, the robot does that. So when a review is approved, it does the full test run. And if that passes, then it lands, okay? So well, what that means is that that is part of like the quality control cycle. You, know, uh, you don't have to do those things by hand. It kind of reduces your regressions. I don't know if GDP needs to go that far, but what I think is like something involving not losing patches and not requiring people to pay and maybe broader participation in patch review would be good things to have. Um, there's a couple, there are multiple systems out there. You know, there's Garrett, there's Fabricator, there's one that I can never remember the name of. Uh, there's one that runs in Mozilla written by Tom Taylor, and there's um, Patchwork, and then there may be others I'm unfamiliar with. Now, of all those, I, I hate Fabricator, I think it's quite bad, it doesn't really let you do patch series, but Garrett's pretty good, we use that at Data Corp. That would require switching to like a web based Patch review could be good, except the issue with patch review is when a patch lands, you know, the robot the site doesn't notice. So if you go look at our actually existing patch view, patchwork system, it's full of thousands of patches that have already landed or been abandoned because it's too dumb to notice. So yeah, it's manual and that's completely unacceptable, but it can be salvaged with like some scripting if we wanted to do that. That would preserve like an email based approach if we wanted to do that. You know, that's like the lowest effort or lowest change. But I just think some changes along those lines are warranted. You know, because I noticed like, um, you know, like this year, Pedro went on vacation for a month 
I don't know if anyone else noticed, but I noticed suddenly the patch backlog was twice as deep, you know. Um, and uh, things for me, it's like I kind of read things in a peculiar way, and so if things go off the sort of 200 message horizon, they've gone forever. Like maybe if I I can catch up backwards sometimes, but you know, without a thing, it's just gone. So yeah, okay, that's all. I had like an essay. That's <laughs> what I wanted to say. Okay. So, uh, just one comment, uh, because you said uh, so. I agree that it's bad practice a lot, and I've worked on a lot of people, like I'm working at LPM, working with public data and whatnot. Um, my comment I want want to make is. Just because you use a system, whatever it is, doesn't necessarily mean you don't have things. Like, oh, the end you put stuff in public chamber and you set the revenues, and then still nothing happens. You I still have to think in public chamber. Yeah. yeah. See, Mozilla went so, a little further and had like a culture of, on yeah, Firefox, it's a culture kind of guaranteed a two or three day review, and Rust was pretty similar or whatever. People took it point, seriously. It's not so much a tools thing, it's a culture thing. Yeah, well, part of it was also. <laughs> Like in Rust, the robot assigns a particular person to review, not like a group of people or a group of reviewers. It's that person's review queue. And if you get too far behind at some point, they start telling you, hey, you know, you're not actually doing reviews and we're going to kick you out or, you know, that kind of thing. Like, uh, I think that's an interesting comparison, to, but I think we have to remember if it, it's not mappable, I think, because. In those two projects, you have Mozilla behind. Well, most yeah. of people are employees. Rust, no, Rust is actually largely volunteer run. You know, the actual core hired by Mozilla is quite small. But you're correct about Mozilla itself. Um, Mozilla had an external structure. You know, like you can complain to someone's manager, which is like hanging home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Simon Hannes. Simon Joseph. Yeah, I just want to say that I agree with Tom on pretty much everything you said. Uh, currently at Markham Company, we're using Garrett, Garrett plus Jenkins, and the setup is just so easy and natural. Uh, because I am I really don't think that the solution that would be based on, let's say we want to do automatic testing of every patch, uh, a system that would try to apply, like, Read the patch series and apply it. Uh, it's I feel it be just a lot of wasted time because there's so many problems. You know, we try to apply patches and it's small form and everything. Whereas with Jenk, the way you push a patch into Jenkins is you push a commit, and then it's natural to just check out the commit and test it. So it's I feel like it's a waste of time to try to apply patches in a script to test them. And uh, I also agree that maybe not everybody tries to hear it here, but I find found it. That was that, that's the one that was the most uh, that respected the most kind of the versions of the patch series. Uh, whereas uh, GitHub is notoriously bad. Like push a commit, then you amend it, you push it again, it just overrides the first one, which <coughs> is eventually to be lost. Whereas we we get to clearly see V1 to V27 and can go back to this like these two versions. And I, I found it that for coming from an email based workflow, it was. Quite natural. Does the end version end up being rebased on top of the current master, or or does it like merge? Is it like a linear? Does preserve a linear history? Can you do that? Yes, you can do whatever you want. Like you decide what you. Do. It's pretty much the same, I think, on GitHub, where when you finally merge the pull request, uh, by default it'll propose you to do a merge. But if you prefer to do a linear history for whatever reason, you can also do that. Right, so, but yes, the area that I'll do is that. Um, other than the tooling, I just want to make a little remark, which is that sometimes what happens, also in DDB, because I have been asked to ask for the CTF stuff, by the way, um, you, sometimes you, some, you send something, and then you get a super fast answer, super nice, like Tom, for example, with the CTF. Yeah, you know, okay, this looks cool, uh, change this, this could be put this way. So then you create a second version of the patch because you are very enthusiastic and you are happy about it. And then you send the second version. And then crickets for mm -hmm. weeks. So sometimes the, the, 
the difficult part is not to get a reviewer, is you get a, a review very fast, then you follow up, and then somehow someone drops the ball, right? Yeah. So it's about commitment to when a review is started to give it some completion. Because I understand that some platform maintainers they hesitate to give you the okay, right? Because well, if, if it breaks something, right, and the maintainer actually gave you the okay, but it's important to have completion. So sometimes what happens when I create those cases, typically what happens is I don't understand the part of the patch or the area of the code that, that well. So it's it's an S390 patch. It's going to be endless. It's going to review that. But I spot some overall things, maybe formatting or you miss the documentation change or news change, and I'll say that. And I don't intend to review the technical aspects, but I'm thinking, well, at least I can help with those little bits and get the thing a little bit closer to, to completion. Yeah, but when the next version comes along, I just shut up. But the review happens, but without an OK, uh, it's, it's useless. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's the goal of it. Yeah, I think um, my, my, what, what you bring to my mind is that uh, we need to be able to, uh, to have some kind of metrics to identify things that have been stored. And having uh, some tools that can track everything, then we can extract metrics on who has, hey, you know, this guy sent a patch two weeks ago and we haven't done anything. Or, you know, we sent a review, but you never really replied. So this, this, uh, this patch may be pushed on the inactive queue for now and then kind of like not be in our radar anymore because, well, we sent an answer and nothing happened afterwards. Things like that. Yeah, and for me, with, with email, that's the problem. If I do a first review for somebody, then they send a new version. Sometimes I'll just miss it because it's in the flow of email, and if they did not CC me, you just miss it. Then I have a, yeah, a 2,000 unread emails in my GD patches uh, folder, so it's quite hard to scan. And also, if I try want to see, okay, I'll want to do a good action, I'll go find if there's some old problem patches. I have no idea. Of all those 2,000 emails, which one are still open or not? Which to me is it's an advantage of things like Gary because if I have to reply to a V1, then when the person does upload a new version, it will pop up again in my Gary to say, hey, you have a new version for this patch that you have already reviewed. And if I don't intend to review it again, like Pedro said, I, then I can maybe ask somebody else, like, hey, you seem to be a good person to continue the review. Maybe. Yeah. But at least it won't be forgotten in the, like you can filter by okay, what's still open. Yeah, that's where the tools can help. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Reminding think, and, yeah. Well, I think it's a little bit of a matter of tool, not just open. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it, it's true that if we intend to not review version two, then maybe we should be proactive you know, as reviewers uh, to say, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm not going to review version two, but such and such person would be a good person or or say, hey, can someone do it? And if not, I mean, we have to take our responsibilities as global reviewers and then say, uh, please review this, you know? Or please, you know, can you do this? No, I can't. Okay, well, how about you, you know? And then kind of us make the effort while, you know, we're still on the email based system. Well, see, you say sure. that you are not continuing the review, yeah. that will help a lot. Mm -hmm. okay. So that these things about like the, the review with backwards, like if you, if you submit a patch and the first review is kind of like, um, it's kind of uh, more that Carlos spoke well in mind, but like if, if you submit a patch and the first review it's kind of like it, here's some white space changes and it added nothing out, mm -hmm. then that kind of implies that all the tech is fine. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you like that shouldn't be the first review. If you're going to review it like that and it's not to send it back and their ideas reviewed, mm -hmm. and that's the wrong way. So I think maybe if you can't, if a, if a patch lands and you can't review the ideas because you don't know that it's you don't know about actually going to or something like that, then maybe like that that perhaps has to be reviewed by someone who knows yeah. what it is before anyone then comes on board and says that you know what she does the problem that was the problem. No, I'm saying I was doing that maybe maybe the problem is I don't say it yeah. explicitly like exactly. that. I should say, you know, we risk recommendation. And this is not a technical review, we'll need someone else. And if I say this explicitly, mm -hmm. it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I admit mean, I forgot to do that at some point. I mean, I mean, like, maybe say, like, I don't, you know, this, I've noticed that the patch is just a documentation, but 
I'm not reviewing the tennis that way. So maybe let's have uh, this is just something to remember uh, when you set that up. So I'm thinking, do we need to set up a wiki page on like um, pedigree, <laughs> cash review, maybe, uh, yeah. processes, or do we? I think it might be useful. Yeah, I'd, I'd say for some of the very occasional review stuff, that sort of reminder of the things you have to go through. And yeah, so that new, newbies can also see the process that we are. Yeah, spending. newbies and oldies who don't do it very much. But uh, I really want to stress that, in my opinion, email-based reviews are just, uh, you know, they, they can work, mm -hmm. but uh, compared to uh, like a system which is uh, designed in order to help facilitate reviews, I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly inferior. And that comes from someone who is very against the introduction of the area of the core at the very beginning. So, uh, yeah. So, so yeah. one of the things that uh, Jeff mentioned in the GCC session earlier today is that uh, formatting things ought to be handled automatically. So we, we, we as reviewers shouldn't be spending our time on white space and, mm -hmm. and all, all that stuff. That sh there should be some sort of tool that looks at the patch and <laughs> finds those problems. Well, and the pro the problem is, is I've looked at that and there is no tool. There's can you and Dan, which just it's hopeless. Yes. hopeless. And there's um, the climb one. Climb format. Yeah, climb format. So I wrote a, I sat down one day and I went through its entire guide and wrote a climb format config file for QB. And then I ran it on selected files and looked at the divs. And the real problem is that um, some of its output is just ugly. Yeah. Like it's stuff that I would reject as a patch, you know, mm -hmm. where it, the way it um, boxes arguments and functions and stuff is just really strange. Like I don't understand who likes that style. Um, I mean, I do know it's them, but like I don't. And so uh, I didn't. I didn't consider it acceptable for the or I would have proposed it. So. Well, we could at least do. Trailing white space stuff, and I mean, there, there's a few things we could at least catch. That's true. And uh, <clears throat> punctuation on change logs, although the, actually that was another topic at that <laughs> thing is, is getting rid of change logs. But I, mean, I don't know if we want to talk about that or not. It, it was actually about getting rid of change log files. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah or, or auto generating at release time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but you still want to capture. Yes, you do. For, Forensics work out what's going on. Right. Um, yeah, maybe we should uh, another topic after this. Okay. Yeah, so the, about the auto formatting, I, it's true that we don't have a good solution for now because what we said for now, client format is uh, the output is not great. Uh, but for another project, uh, participate, participate to, uh, we use Black for Python formatting. So it's, Parking formatting is something similar. And at first, we didn't really like the fact that, oh, I don't like the way formats this function call or whatever. But in the end, we really appreciate the cognitive, the, the reduced, reduced cognitive chart uh, when writing code. Because when, when I write this code now, I just write it super ugly because I'm not passing through the that machine, so I don't care. And as a reviewer, I know I don't have to care because the CI will reject it if it's a wrong tool and if there's a change. You're saying so, maybe we should just say, say uh, you know, it's like the trade off between convenience and uh, yeah. aesthetics. We should at least too, too picky on the formatting, say, like, like, let some things go in favor. Well, that's how that's how we used to do with GDB back, back before C. Is we would use GNU indent with certain options, and that was the standard. Really? That was, yeah, that was back in the Cagney days. I still have the script checked in, I think. Yeah. And I did that on one file and I got yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the result was significantly different. Uh, it impacted everyone who had the local modifications to that file as well. And the result was, yeah, it was tough. I mean, me, I'm on board with that solution of accepting uh, whatever uh, a program produces as long as the output is stable. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case, but 
if the output is stable, as I've learned from programming in Python, which has a significantly different uh, uh, form, uh, guide, like a style, compared to Ada, especially, um, that at the beginning I was like, ooh, but now it just looks completely natural. So I think uh, it's it's a it's a like a it's something that is trained as opposed to something that is inherent to us. Can, can I suggest that it is something that wastes a lot of, of valuable reviewers' mm -hmm. time? And I personally am prepared to live with either the process says you put it through plan format or an indent or whatever this week later is. And I've been kind of almost to say either it goes to 100% and you just submit it, and if it passes, that's okay, even if it's a bit ugly at times. Or you put in your bug patch submission the output of panning then of what's different and say, I'm keeping this because it looks better. Yes. Um, and basically, then the reviewer just knows, well, these five lines are wrong. They might say, no, this is got to be fixed or not. But you just don't want to be spending your gut. You know, people you know this. It's like when I submit a document for review that's a bid for a million pound contract, I want someone to say, actually, in the middle, you should have said 500,000, not that I've left out a comma. Okay? <laughs> and we're too good at spotting the missing commas and not that we've accidentally doubled the price. You know, um, um, that's where we want the brains to be focused. So, yeah. I'd live with a bit of rough formatting. <laughs> it, it's my understanding that the way that LOPM at least all the review works, uh, how they are best speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they use client format, and there's a way to have it only adjust or complain about code that you're touching. Yeah, you get the client format. So, yeah. so it, whatever is already in the file that you're not touching, it leaves the, the format as is. And that, that, that means that you're not obligated to accept by the tool outputs. If you don't like it for some reason, it's broken. The tool doesn't format properly. You can adjust it. You can just say it on the submission. Well, and then you commit it. And from that point on, the tool is not going to reformat the adjustment. Because if somebody else touches that line again, that code. All right, mm -hmm. So it doesn't. The tool that way doesn't force you. It helps you. It is also because the formatting is changing with time, so it will be reformatting all the parts anyway. So, you know, as time is developing and the formatting is changing, the scale of this. Okay. Um, so, we discussed hash review tools. We, we had some positive things to say about Gary, as well as Sam. That's kind of the two people favor. I've never used it. I uh, myself, I'm very used to email. It's kind of like, it's because I'm used to it, but I'm open to trying other things. Uh, I think if, if you can have both processes at the same time, at least as a position phase, or as a backup channel or something, I think I would like to see that. I think maybe that's just me. Things like having, things like, um, you know, I guess you're, you're kind of very used to doing stuff with email, but if I go into it, you're bad. But you're you're more on top of it now. You are I don't you're you're reviewing patches constantly, so you have a good head I don't know head which patches are in what state. But that's in your head, it's not anywhere else, it's not somewhere I can see. So I look at I look into new patches, it's a huge bunch of emails, some are answered, some are not, like it's kind of is somebody reviewing this already? Am I am I gonna do this one and someone's gonna go forward to that by the time I get to the end? Is this no, there's a lot more questions. No, it's it, it, it is not true that I keep everything in my head. It's just like like Tom said, I went to vacation. When I came back, I had like you know, four thousand emails. I already had a backlog to do it actually. And for the past few weeks, I've been struggling to get back to it. And there's always something else to do. You distract and suddenly you have like. <laughs> so you're saying that now that now that you've taken your way out, then you're finding it also hard to head up. This is basically the thing I was saying. So I'm saying I'm, I'm fine with experimenting with other things, mm -hmm. but I think having a position would not like having a cycle here from now on. We could right. have a position. Yeah. I think it's better. Uh, yeah, I don't think we should uh, set ourselves and Gary right from the get go. Yeah. I mean, we can show a little bit what Gary does. Um, at the same time, I think we need to agree or not on what would be acceptable to uh, give up <coughs> in order to have a better system. 
because uh, it's a situation where I don't uh, I don't think we can uh, keep everything like it was before and add all these new features that we might be looking for. And so, what are we prepared to give up versus what are we uh, really add enough that we must keep? And then from there, then we can determine which options we have. Because if uh, let's say uh, uh, email based and uh, web based reviews you know, being possible, and then they kind of somehow being tracked by the system is a requirement, and then that that might eliminate Garrett, which would be fine, you know. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you can Garrett and have fewer options, and then uh, what are we going to get on the other? So to me, what's really interesting yeah, is to agree on what is do we really, really, really want, what do we you know desire. And then what so, can you give up? I think we have different perspectives here because I have no experience. So mm -hmm. in my mind, it's like I want to agree, yeah. but I've never used it. So yeah. I, I feel like I need to use it for a while right. you know, before saying more. Yeah. So, so I think maybe set it up mm -hmm. and say it's an automatic channel, maybe, and yeah. the patches go all over the Garrett mm -hmm. channel and you guys yeah. submit each other's patches and whoever else wants to use it. And then, Maybe I try to submit a patch series, and I know this only doesn't work for me for some reason, and we discuss more about that. Yeah, exactly. One thing we can do is uh, is set up uh, like a parallel system for some patches. Hey guys, um, I'm submitting. You know, as a, as a author, I would prefer to go through the real system like this way, and it goes there instead of going to GB patches. And GB patches can still be notified about oh yes about the patch, right? Except that the review now doesn't have the to be patched but on here. Okay. And then the notes from the reviews get forwarded to the patch. So this is actually exactly what OVM is. OVM used to have to be the main mm -hmm. And then it was just channel and private yes. set up and say whatever cable was the And the email was still in the manual people came. And just the way the fabricator was set up, once you submit the patch, you have to it. Yeah. They were also sent to the list. All the old fabricator comments would be sent to the list. Yeah. And so people didn't like fabricator still could follow all the patches that support the list. Yeah. And just over time, most people moved over to fabricator and mm -hmm. then what became an official fabricator. Hopefully, yeah. Now mm it's -hmm. the one. But I think it's still Yeah, it's still. Okay, so this is a great conversation, but we'll probably make it into the next session. Well, <laughs> okay. so, can you read the yeah, okay. um, um, action points? Mm -hmm. It sounds like we have some kind of agreement that is to experiment with things. Does anyone want to volunteer to set up something like that? Joe, I don't know if you guys uh, you have experience. I would love to do it, I'm just short of time. I just don't know when I have time. <laughs> uh, even for my own company, I yes. want to do it for my own company to upgrade. And uh, okay. I think I, I'm used to setting up <laughs> they think right. so again. Yeah. One thing we can maybe do is discuss with our uh, if you if you if you need a machine or something like this, right? Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> I can you know you and I can talk and then I can't promise, but at least I can try to ask because we made we made some changes in the way we organize our network right. to allow machines that completely on the outside. Um, <laughs> so we're checking your boss first. I think we discussed all the topics except the bar standard. We didn't know we're out of time for that discussion, maybe. <clears throat> or do you think we can discuss that in the real system? It's great. Nobody's jumping up to say that, do they? Yeah, that's a yeah. problem. Well, that's the way it's so, so, yeah, it would be good. No, so we we used to have GDB folks on the committee. Did they all just leave, or yeah, yeah? So that was Andrew Kearney, and he's still there. I think Jason Melinda is also in the committee. Wow. Yeah. Jason is working at Apple on LDB for some years. Andrew Kearney is doing no no. Oh. Uh, and over time, we just end up in a situation where we have no one on the GDB side. We have people on the GDC side. We have Jason uh, Merrill, Merrill, and Jakob Gelenek. And um, I've been trying to volunteer Mark Wheeler. 
rest of the years and do that. I heard he'll do it. <laughs> oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. No, 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 no. <laughs> so everyone agrees that Mark is going to be our <laughs> Any other topics just for closure? 30 seconds? No? Thanks for attending, for the discussion, for being so productive, and uh, see you next year. <laughs>